I'm going to talk about belief, specifically the problem of religious belief, because I happen to think that how we deal with belief, how we criticize or fail to criticize the beliefs of other human beings at this moment has more to do with the maintenance of civilization than anything else that is in our power to influence. Our world has been balkanized, as Moses just said, by incompatible religious dogmas. We have Christians against Muslims, against Jews. The books themselves make incompatible claims. We have, we have this founding notion that God wrote one of our texts. Unfortunately, we have many such books on hand. Now, before I launch into my heresy, I, I want to say up front that, that I'm going to offend a few people in this room. I know you are a, very likely a secular bunch. I, um, I come from a country to your south that is fast growing as blinkered by religious lunacy as the wilds of Afghanistan. But still, I think uh, some people in this room will be offended by what I say. I want to say up front that my, my intention really is not to offend anyone. I'm not being deliberately provocative. I'm simply worried. I'm going to worry out loud for the next 20 minutes. Because I, I see no reason for us to expect to survive our religious differences indefinitely. It seems to me transparently obvious that the, the marriage of 21st century technology, forget about nuclear weapons and biological weapons, even, even the, the computational technology we heard about this morning, the fact that a, a few short years from now, you'll be able to sit in a cave in Afghanistan, and with your thousand dollar laptop, you will essentially have a supercomputer that can kick off its genetic algorithms, its malicious code, to the rest of society. This alone makes, makes this balkanization of our world, the, the separate moral identities, the fact that we're not identified just merely as being human beings, but we are Muslims and Jews. It makes it untenable. So, briefly, what is a belief? What does it mean to believe something to be true? Well, clearly, beliefs are representations of the world. But there are more than that. There's the difference between a belief and a hope, say, I mean, I can, I can hope that I have won the lottery. That is a representation of the world. It's a representation of a possible state of the world. But believing I have won the lottery is the only thing that actually opens the, the floodgates of emotion and behavior to, to behavior and emotion that's appropriate to actually having won the lottery. Then you go on that lunatic shopping spree and offend all of your friends. The difference that makes the difference is believing that your thought, your certain propositions held in mind, actually map on to reality. Now, if you, if you think this is an abstraction, just imagine the transformation in your physiology at this moment, in your neurology, in your psychology, if you came to believe that your child had been taken hostage. You know, first you have to have a child, that child has to be in some appropriately war-torn place, but it, given the requisite conditions, you get a phone call, mere language, a mere sentence spoken into your ear, should you grant it credence, would completely transform your life. All the panic that would precipitate out of that experience would be born of, of, of believing a certain representation of the world. So this is, this is why beliefs really are, are machinery for guiding our behavior and emotion through time. It's not an, we don't yet understand this at the level of the brain. I'm trying to understand this through functional neuroimaging, but at the level of our conversation with ourselves, at the level of thought, it's pretty clear we're talking about linguistic representations of the world. So what do people believe? Well, where I come from, in the U.S., 22% of the population claims to be certain, literally certain, that Jesus is going to come down out of the clouds and save the day sometime in the next 50 years. Certain. Another 22% think he probably will come back in the next 50 years. 
This is 44% of the electorate. These people not only elect our congressmen and presidents, they get elected as congressmen and presidents. This should be terrifying to all of us. I mean, these, these, this belief obviously does not exist in isolation. It's not, a, not an accident that 44% of Americans also want creationism taught in the schools and evolution no longer taught. See, actually, 62% of Americans want creationism taught in the schools, but 44% want it taught exclusively. I mean, we're building a civilization of ignorance. 44% of Americans also believe that the creator of the universe literally promised the land of Israel to the Jews in his role as an omniscient real estate broker. <laughs> it's clear that this belief has geopolitical consequences. This is not... This is, these beliefs don't exist merely on Sundays, when we get together to talk about God and the Bible. Take another belief that would seemingly would have very uh, minor consequences. Consider the, the Catholic belief that, that condom use is sinful. Okay, now this is obviously, uh, from my point of view, obviously a total falsification of morality. I mean, this is what, one thing that religious dogma does is it separates questions of morality from questions of real suffering, human suffering, animal suffering. Here we have no discernible suffering at all, and yet we're told it's a moral, prop, moral proposition that condom use is, is ethically problematic. What are the possible consequences here? Well, we have millions of people every year dying of AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa alone. And you have, quite literally, Catholic ministers preaching the sinfulness of condom use in villages where the only information about condom use is the, the representation of, of the ministry. It seems to me that we should not, the time for respecting religious beliefs of this sort is long past. You take another effect of religious dogmatism in my own country. We have college-educated politicians resisting stem cell research, certainly impeding its progress, not funding it, putting up one roadblock after another. Probably one of the most promising lines of research in biology to generate medical therapies is being impeded by this medieval notion that the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception and therefore blastocysts in a petri dish, literally undifferentiated clumps of cells, have to be given the same kind of moral concern, have the same interests, have the same... No one even talks about suffering, but presumably we're, we're worried about their experience at some level. And that the interests of these cells trump the interests of eight-year-old girls with diabetes or 40-year-old men with Parkinson's. Okay, the conversation never gets had. The, the, the moral arguments never even have to be made at a political level because it is fundamentally taboo to criticize someone's religious beliefs. Faith is, is really a conversation stopper. Now, in response to these sorts of problems, many of us, many well-intentioned people, have come to think that, that the appropriate accommodation with modernity is to develop what's called religious moderation, generally. You can have your God, you can talk about him in some, or her, in some unspecified way. It, it's, it's considered unseemly to be too sure about what happens after death and about the moral structure to this universe, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Religious moderation is the way to go. And, and, and really the soul of religious moderation is this political correctness where everyone should be free to believe whatever he wants about God. There's just no harm, no foul, beliefs are private. Let me tell you for a moment why I think this is a dead end. First of all, religious moderation gives cover to religious fundamentalism. Because we cannot criticize 
religious extremism, religious literalism, because it's politically taboo, it's, it's considered uncivil, and this is really enforced by religious moderates. Religious fundamentalists, they'll criticize every faith but their own. You know, the religious fundamentalists in my country will say Islam is an evil religion. Religious moderates balk at that. And so now we can't, you know, it, George Bush can call a press conference and announce to the world that he's going to appoint common sense judges. This is a quote. I'm going to appoint common sense judges who realize that our rights are derived from God. 